Uh, good evening, all. Welcome to the Wilson Development Review Board meeting of September 27, 2022. My name is Pete Kelly. I'm chair of the DRB. If you are a Zoom participant, please sign in by renaming yourself on the participant toolbar if your name is not currently displayed. This is a hybrid meeting taking place in town hall and virtually on Zoom. All members of the board and public can communicate in real time. Planning staff will provide Zoom instructions for public participation before we begin. All votes taken at the meeting will be done by roll call vote in accordance with the law. If Zoom crashes, the meeting will be continued to October 11, 2022. I'm going to start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance of DRB members. Paul Christensen. Here. John Hamilcarn. Here. Scott Riley. Here. Dave Turner. Here. Nate Andrews is absent and the chair is present. We have uh, five members of the DRB present, so we have a quorum. Uh, first up is on the agenda is the public forum. This is an opportunity for anyone either present here or participating in, uh, via Zoom to address the board on topics that are not on tonight's agenda. Uh, if you're present and you want to address the board, uh, please raise your hand. If you're on Zoom and you want to address the board, please raise your virtual hand. So we have no hands in the audience here, and we also have no hands on Zoom. Okay, thank you. Uh, agenda item number two is the public hearing. We've got four items on tonight's agenda, DP 20-18, which is a pre-app, Ethan Allen Homes, LLC, also referred to, at least by me, as the uh, redevelopment of the Catamount Golf Club. DP 10-34.6 is Chittenden Solid Waste District uh, to have us consider a new parking area on a previously approved project. DP 21-18, the annex, uh, that's the large residential uh, project at the Essex Alliance Church property and DP 22 dash 06 Green State Realty LLC. That's the redevelopment of 4626 Williston Road uh, and um, at the intersection of Industrial Avenue. Um, so first up is DP 20-18 uh, Ethan Allen Homes LLC. Uh, would the applicant please come forward? Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I will be recusing myself on this as I have every time in the, in the past as an abutting landowner. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, for the record, that leaves us uh, four members of the DRB. We still maintain a quorum. <clears throat> Welcome, gentlemen. If you would state your name and address for the record, please. Sure, Ken Bellavo, 683 Maple Street, Waterbury Center, Vermont, 05677. I'm here representing the applicant, Ethan Allen Holmes, LLC. Christopher Sunasek, 86 Ethan Allen Drive, South Burlington, Vermont, 05403. I'm here for the Summerfield application. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, staff goes first. All right. This is a request for pre-application review for DP 20-18 Summerfield to participate in March 2023 growth management review. The sole purpose of this application is to meet the requirement of WDB 11.4.1. This bylaw standard requires a project to have pre-application approval from the DRB before it can move forward to growth management review in the upcoming year. No changes to the approved final plans or conditions of approval are requested. The DRB may recall that this received complete discretionary review, permit review and approval um, in April 2022 for overall site design and the first phase of development. And what follows is a motion uh, to move this application forward to growth management. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Emily. 
Uh, so this is this is really just a format uh, formality um, due to the Williston process and the allocation limits that are out there within the growth management process. So I would normally turn it over to the applicant to uh, comment. And uh, in this particular case, um, I don't think that's necessary. If if you feel otherwise, let me know. But I. I, I just don't think that it's necessary tonight. Would you concur? Um, I did have one comment that I wanted to make. Okay. I can never show up at a meeting and <laughs> not say something. Can I second that? <laughs> <laughs> um, just in the interest of full disclosure, I just wanted to point out that the site plan that we submitted with the application, this is the same plan that we submitted for DP review. And um, so there were conditions of approval as part of that. Um, we have a year to file final plans. We haven't filed final plans yet. So um, there were some of the things that the board wanted us to make some modifications to the plan. We haven't submitted those plans yet. So I just wanted to point that out, that this is the same plan that we submitted when we submitted our application for DP for discretionary permit approval back in the spring. But otherwise, um, you know, as, as both uh, Pete, you've said, and, and Emily has said, um, we're going through this, that the project is well known to the board, and um, we'd like to come back and see if we can get some more of the allocation back in March. Great. Okay. Ken, that was meaningful. Thank you uh, for pointing that out. Um, uh, that was a sincere statement. I want to know. I, I took it as such. Okay. Um, board members, any questions? Okay, uh, we're going to close DP 20-18 at 7.09. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, next up, DP 10-34.6, uh, Chittenden Solid Waste District. Uh, who is here for the applicant? Carl Marcuson, Olivia Mark, 13 Corporate Drive, Essex Junction for Lot 05452. Uh, I, think, I think Josh is on um, Zoom, so he's he is. But I'm um, just in case. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Josh. Right. Josh Tyler, Chittenden Waste District, 1021 Redmond Road, Wilson, Vermont. Great. Thank you and welcome. Uh, staff goes next. All right, that's me. Um, Chittenden Solid Waste District requests a discretionary permit amendment to reconfigure parking for the previously approved access and scale house for the CSWD organic diversion facility located at 1042 Redmond Road in the industrial zoning district east. The property is currently developed with an ODF facility operated by the landowner Chipman Solid Waste District. Um, staff is recommending DRB take testimony and close the hearing, deliberate, and approve the project. Um, this is the first time the DRB has seen this project. Um, the scale of the project does not require pre-application. Um, and there's a list of prior approvals. Um, neither the Conservation Commission nor the HAC reviewed this project. Public Works um, and Fire reviewed the project and submitted comments only saying that they didn't have any comments on the proposed changes. No comment letters were received at the time of the mail out. Uh, September 22nd. Um, the dimensional standards comply as proposed. Um, outdoor sale, sales and storage comply, complies as proposed. Um, the Chittenden Solid Waste District has a partial exemption um, because they are a regional solid waste management facility. Um, so wholesale trade and retail trade are not ordinarily permitted in this district, but they are allowed under this partial exemption. Um, the proposed project is the sixth amendment to the development um, previously approved by the DRB as DP 1034. Um, the scope of the hearing and the DRB action will be limited to determining whether the proposed amendment complies or fails to comply with the bylaw. Um, the scope of the review may be expanded when the subject property is not, not in full compliance with the bylaw. So um, 
really uh, what they've requested is a reconfiguration of the um, previously proposed parking area. Um, the reconfiguration can comply as proposed if the DRB uses the flexibility allowed under WDB 14A for industrial uses, um, meaning that that um, 14A provides a starting point of one space per thousand square feet, but because industrial uses are quite varied, there's flexibility um, allowed. Um, the previously proposed site plan <coughs> provided nine vehicle parking spaces, including one ADA space, four outdoor short-term bicycle spaces, three long-term bicycle spaces, and one end-of-trip facility in the scale house building. The applicant is proposing um, to reconfigure the parking as shown and add four vehicular spaces for a total of 13 spaces to accommodate anticipated high usage of the residential organics drop-off location. The requirements for ADA spaces, short and long-term bicycle parking spaces, and end-of-trip facility remain the same for the new configuration as for the previously approved configuration. Um, the proposed parking lot design, dimensions, ADA, and bicycle parking all comply with the standards of WDB 14. Uh, the ADA space must be marked on the site plan, and the site plan must delineate the location of proposed short and long-term bicycle parking spaces and end-of-trip facility, and these conditions have been drafted. Um, also, uh, staff noted that uh, the snow storage area um, required to be shown on the site plan is shown um, where the proposed parking area is. Um, I'm assuming that's an oversight, uh, something that wasn't changed from the previous plan. The staff is recommending that final plans designate a different area for snow storage and a condition has been drafted. Um, now, when you say different area, what do you mean? Meaning it can't be in the parking area, it has to be the snow storage has to be outside of the designated parking area. I mean, it can't be taking, it can't be in a parking space. Okay. Um, so, let's see. Um, the outdoor lighting uh, complies as proposed. Um, the applicants provided a lighting plan. I believe they're just moving the location of one of the um, po uh, pole fixtures, but not adding any lighting. Um, and, and that's it. Okay, thank you, Melinda. Okay, uh, Carl and Josh. So you are expanding, you're proposing to expand the parking lot to accommodate what you believe is a need for more spaces. Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. Okay. And, uh, and where is the snow storage going to be on the proposed new, new, uh, you want, you want to project the graphic up on the screen and you can, Carl, you can show so us. The lagoon that's getting filled as part of the project is going to be basically pushed off to that side. So if we can bring up the graphic, I mean, it's basically going to be, um, if you're looking at the plan to the right side, if you can zoom in on that uh, existing building. Um, yeah, let me zoom in there. So the lagoon that's no longer getting used, which is why they're having to bring in water, it's going to get pushed off to the side there. So we regraded um, the parking lot to be a little bit more modest grading, and then it's raised, and it's going to go off basically to the right side as you're looking at it now. So that's where we're going to push the snow on, off the parking to the right. Would you do me a favor and yeah. point that out, please? Yeah. I, I wasn't quite tracking. So basically, all the way, maybe so we can get regraded. This is showing the length of the wire. So everything's going to be pushed off. Okay. Got it. Oh, nice. You can walk right up there. That's cool. That's awesome. You can and always push it where the leaf pile is and it goes down in sure. the winter, too. Kind of tight out in the I think we're just really changing for flow through. I mean, that's the main emphasis. Yeah. You know. Okay. Yep. Right. Melinda, can you show on the screen where he pointed to on, this, on his screen? Um, Thank you. Yeah. All right. That's what I thought. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you, John. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Uh, any uh, further 
uh, clarifications on your proposed plan before I turn it over to the board to ask questions? I don't know if Josh has anything, but I, I don't. I think it's uh, fairly straightforward. Yeah, I do too. Josh, Good. do you have, have yeah, any? The real, the real move is to add, allow for uh, a safer, safer movement of traffic through to allow for throughput. So that's really why we made that change. But yeah, everything else has been covered in the description. That's pretty much what I had for a narrative. Great, thank you. DRP members, questions? <laughs> I think the, the only question I would have is um, is to just an, an explanation of why the additional four spaces are necessary. That's to accommodate uh, a higher volume of traffic. So currently down Redmond Road, we accept organics at our Williston drop-off center, and we have two stations. We have one outside of our drop-off center um, to accommodate people who are coming in just to drop off their organics. And that was really put in because we no longer took organics at our ODF facility. We want to move it back up the road and we want to accommodate people coming through. We've seen a higher volume of people who participate in organics drop off. So our initial design didn't, in our opinion, when we had a time, had, had a chance to take a second look at it, I had enough space to accommodate more than, you know, a significant amount of flow. Um, we also added that um, um, the traffic that would come in one way versus having to pull in, park, drop off, back up and pull out the same way you came in. So um, from a safety perspective, that's kind of what we really focused on with this, this redesign is to help accommodate more people to come through so their experience is nicer and to keep it a little bit safer so you don't have to back up once you drop off your material and come out the same way you came in. Um, and it also helps, uh, it will be enough room for people if they have trailers. So if you do want to bring in organics and you have a trailer full of leaf and yard waste, um, it's a much more convenient um, a throughput so that people can get in and do that as well. And that's why we add those extra spaces in. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, explanation. Yeah, I think, I think it's a much better design. I do. I agree. Okay. Uh, members of the public, any comments? Uh, no raised hands in the audience, and no raised hands on Zoom. Okay. Uh, DRB members, last call? No, good. Nothing. Applicant, last call? Good. Okay. Uh, we're going to close DP 10-34.6 at 7.22. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, next up, DP 21-18, the Annex, uh, Snyder Group, Inc., who is here for the applicant. Snyder. Hey, Chris. <coughs> Good evening. Dan. You yeah. would, uh, just for your, state your address for the record, please. Yep. Chris Snyder with Snyder Homes, 4076 Shelburne Road, uh, Suite 6, Shelburne. Thank you. Yep. And Dan Heil, Trudell Consulting Engineers, 478 Blair Parker Road, Wilson. Welcome. Uh, Andy, are you going to participate or? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, if you would both introduce yourself and your address, please. Andy Little, Schneider Holmes, 4076 Shelton Road. Thank you, sir. Schneider Consulting Engineers, Blair Parker Road, and Wilson. Great. Thank you. Uh, staff goes first. I'm going to. Um, I just. Uh, oh, oh, oh. oh one, 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 more, one more person. Uh, it's Michael Busher, um, landscape architect. I'm here to talk about park design. My business address is 301 College Street, Burlington, Vermont. Again, TG Blood Associates. Um, so, Mr. Riley, you're going to recuse I'm gonna yourself. I'm going to recuse myself. I have a financial interest in some other properties uh, with Mr. Schneider. Okay. <clears throat> This is a request for a discretionary permit to construct phase one of the annex. Phase one includes Beaudry Lane, Alpine Drive, Eden Lane, and a road connection to Chelsea Place, Dunmore Lane. Phase one includes 208 dwellings as 170, 173 DUE, as carriage homes, duplexes, townhomes, 
and two apartment buildings, as well as some park space. Um, future phase two includes a senior living facility and additional townhomes and three 12-unit apartment buildings. Uh, several changes have been made to this application since the July 26th hearing. Highlights include a traffic signal at Alpine Drive and Route 2A intersection, eliminating Cabot Lane, rerouting the multi-use path, reconfiguring Eden Lane, and full design for both parks. We'll go into detail on that momentarily. This property is 54.2 acres. Um, it is currently uh, vacant and developed with a single family house. Uh, it has access on state and town roads where the proposed use is both residential and commercial. It is located in the Taft Corner Zoning District and it was subject to both uh, Conservation Commission review and design review. Uh, tonight, staff is recommending um, that the DRB take testimony review the changes made since the last hearing in July, and continue the hearing to either October 11th or 25th. This continuance will allow commenting departments, Public Works and Fire, time to review and respond to the revised plans. Um, and given that many changes were made, it also gives the DRB and staff am ample time to finalize uh, the findings of fact, conclusions of law, and conditions of approval, most of which have been drafted for you tonight. So, so to that point, Emily, um, so uh, I'm not planning to close tonight. I'm going to continue this. I'm going to continue it uh, unless anybody has any compelling argument. I'm going to continue it to the first meeting in October, which is October 11th. And uh, so just keep that in mind. If you have any comments on that, when it's your turn, please, uh, uh, please make them then. Thank you. Continue. Thanks, Pete. Uh, so this project had its first discretionary permit hearing on July 26th. It had pre-application review uh, last year in September, and it received its first round of growth management uh, allocation in March, uh, where it scored 54 points and was allocated 173.5 DUE. Uh, Conservation Commission and Historic and Architectural Advisory Committee um, both commented on this application. Their recommendations are included as conditions of approval. Public Works um, and fire, FIRE, their comment memos are also included as conditions of approval. Um, and they will be able to provide updated comment memos based on the revised plans. Uh, 43 comment letters were received at the time of mail out and two additional comment letters were received as of today. Um, they are attached in um, your packets. Um, so, so to that, so to that point, members of the audience, um, those those comment letters are all part of the official record, and uh, so just just keep that in mind when we get to the public comment phase. Those are already entered into the record, uh, and there's there's uh, there's no need to re reiterate verbatim. Um, the comments and themes that were uh, in those those inputs. Thank you. Um, what follows is the July 26 uh, discussion items list. Uh, so there were several items that the DRB and staff outlined that needed to be addressed in this application. Um, for each of those comments in italics, I show how the applicant has responded to this. Most of these topics will be discussed throughout the staff report as well. Um, similarly formatted is the pre-application recommendations from September 14th. So this was last year when the DRB reviewed the concept level plans, their comments about meeting the bylaw requirements, and the right column is staff notes identifying um, if that documentation has been provided, if the standard complies, um, overall compliance is anticipated for this development with the pre-application recommendations. Uh, vested rights, non-conforming lots, uses structures. Uh, so this application was submitted um, prior to the select board warning a hearing on Taft Corners form-based code. So it is vested in the current version of the bylaws that we're reviewing tonight. Um, it's also anticipated um, that the select board will hold a hearing on October 4th 
where they're considering a version of form-based code that excludes, excludes this property from the district. So it's possible, no guarantees until the select board hearing, um, but that future amendments might not be subject to the form-based code and this property would remain in the Taft Corner Zoning District as uh, the design and development standards <coughs> exist today. Uh, this property is located in the Taft Corner Zoning District where senior living and residential uses are allowed. Um, with the dimensional standards in terms of lot size, building height and setbacks complies as proposed. Uh, the carriage homes, duplexes and townhomes comply with the 36 foot height limits. Uh, the apartment buildings and senior livings building are eligible for the increase to 52 feet uh, because structure parking at the garage level is at the basement level is provided. Uh, no outdoor sales and storage are proposed nor allowed in this district uh, for commercial uses. And with development pattern, it, this also complies as proposed. Um, as requested, the applicant reconfigured the layout of apartment building B and Eden Lane uh, so that apartment building has more frontage along the street and sidewalk. Um, as well as Cabot Lane was reduced to eliminate wetland impacts and because adequate um, the vehicle access for phase two buildings could be provided from Alpine Drive and Beaudry Lane. Um, one of the future um, buildings in phase two still complies with the frontage requirements because the building comes to the sidewalk. In this case, the building is pulled to the multi-use path. Um, the multi-use path was rerouted to the location where Cabot Lane formerly was proposed. Uh, for Adirondack views, it complies as proposed. The applicant has represented that the views are not present on the site. However, they may be visible from upper story apartments facing west. Uh, and the Taft Corner Zoning District has the five of nine design elements. So a new development in this zoning district must provide five of the nine listed elements. Um, they're providing structured parking, multiple stories, wide sidewalks, and urban park and public artwork. Uh, the DRB may recall discussion at the last meeting about the design, placement, amenities of the urban park, the quality and quantity of the public artwork that's proposed. Um, as requested, the applicant has provided full specifications for the urban park. Um, and, or, excuse me, public park um, is how it's called in the application. Um, it includes wooden play elements that are interesting to both children and adults um, with balanced beam logs, uh, jumping boulders. Um, there's an interesting entryway sculpture um, and then two other sculptures um, around the path loop um, and, and a gateway shelter and picnic tables and benches. Um, the public artwork is proposed to be made of stone and wood uh, overarching design elements. So here, go into some more detail about some of the changes that were made since the last hearing. Um, as requested, they provided on-street parking along Alpine Drive near the Neighborhood Park Community Building. Um, they provided the specifications for both park areas. Um, and the multi-use path was rerouted to avoid wetland impacts. Uh, this alignment has five crossings, whereas the prior alignment had four crossings. Um, however, their crossings are still very minimal um, in terms of the number of um, streets a pedestrian would need to cross. Um, and this alignment does bring the multi-use path along the neighborhood park. Uh, Cabot Lane block, uh, so this was where pre-application the grove was shown. Uh, that design element has been eliminated, but they did provide full specifications for a neighborhood park and are able to provide adequate um, uh, driveway access for the residential buildings. Um, Eden Lane mid block green space. So Eden Lane was reconfigured from the wide radius curved street to a 90 degree block angle. This allowed the applicant to provide some green space uh, near the middle of the block, which aligns with the multi-use path. Um, and is similar to the Muse element that was shown at pre-application for this area. 
Um, sidewalks are shown on the south side of Alpine Drive and they extend to the property line with VSCCU as requested. Um, the west side of Beaudry Lane near Chelsea Place um, also has a sidewalk extension and the Public Works Department is permitting a 20-foot corner radius at that Beaudry Chelsea intersection to approve, improve pedestrian safety. Um, intersection design, so Vermont Agency of Transportation, VTRANS, is requiring a traffic signal at Alpine Drive uh, with some turning lanes on both Alpine Drive and Route 2A. And the other intersections throughout the development will have stop signs. Um, and what follows is more detail about the Eden Lane layout, uh, removing front yard parking um, for the apartment building that was not permissible. Um, and in response to hack comments, they've updated the townhome architectural design. So originally the townhomes did not have front porches uh, facing the street. They had a flat roof um, and the applicant has revised the design to include a pitched roof, some gable elements, and as the hack requested, front porches facing the street to improve pedestrian friendly design and neighborliness. Uh, growth management, the project scored 54 points and received 173.5 DUE at birth management. A DUE is a dwelling unit equivalent whereby a one bedroom or studio apartment is half a DUE and a unit with two or more bedrooms is a full dwelling unit equivalent. <coughs> um, overall compliance is anticipated with the growth management score. Uh, the DRB should discuss the score and the changes made to the neighborhood park. So as requested, they provide full design of the neighborhood park, which is designed for the residents of the neighborhood. It has a community building pool house, um, an outdoor pool, uh, garden space with a yard hydrant, picnic tables and grills, um, some bench style swings, and an open lawn. And for sustainable transportation, compliance is also anticipated. Uh, so th they are required to provide uh, 20 bicycle storage lockers to meet this requirement. They're proposing 10 at the pool house and 10 adjacent to the apartment building's solid waste trash recycling building. Uh, the intent of the standard is that development support transportation sustainability pro by providing publicly available facilities. And the DRB should discuss if these two locations are practical to meet the intent of that standard. Uh, access connectivity traffic studies. Uh, so as discussed earlier, they are working with the Agency of Transportation who regulates uh, the design and in, of intersections onto state highways. Alpine Drive will now include a traffic signal. Uh, Beaudry Lane at Chelsea Place. Um, this image shows the plat from the Chelsea Commons subdivision where a 60-foot right-of-way was given to the town uh, to, to the adjoining property. Um, so the street will connect through here. Uh, Public Works did approve um, narrowing the corner radius of that intersection. There is a raised multi-use path crossing there, so this configuration would um, encourage vehicles to slow down and create shorter walking distance for pedestrians. Uh, traffic study complies as proposed. Uh, one was requested at pre-application and included. They also provided a revised traffic study and um, uploaded following your packet mail out was um, correspondence with VTRANS and a traffic study addendum. Uh, overall, traffic studies look at level of service for vehicle delays. So they're focused on um, if vehicle queuing is going to be at a level that necessitates slip lanes, traffic lights, things that improve um, how long vehicles have to wait as an inter at an inter intersection. Uh, traffic studies do not look at things like pedestrian or cyclist safety, um, traffic speeds, on-street parking. Those are handled by other select board policies like the traffic calming policy, um, the town's road ordinance for on-street parking, vehicle setting vehicle speed limits. Those are handled um, by the select board ordinance, other select board ordinances. Uh, Beaudry Lane, uh, we are recommending that you approve this configuration with a condition that final plans show adequate driveway aprons for adjoining properties at 57 and 60 to 62 Beaudry Lane. 
the existing private driveway will be upgraded to a street. Typically, public work specifications call for a right-of-way width of 64 feet. On September 20th, the select board approved an exception to the 64 width and allowed the portions that are 50 feet and 60 feet to remain um, as shown in this image. Uh, within those reduced portions of right-of-way, they are able to meet the street tree requirement of the bylaw. Um, typically, the bylaw likes to see sidewalks on both sides of the street. However, they're able to provide um, a multi-use path on the south side. Um, and we're recommending that you approve this configuration as proposed. Similar to how the sidewalk extends to the VSCCU property line, when VCU com VSCCU comes in to redevelop um, or do an addition, they would be required to build their portion of sidewalk. Uh, that would be a similar scenario here. If those two properties on the north side of Beaudry Lane were to come to the DRB to redevelop, the DRB could require that section of sidewalk to be constructed, uh, which I measured to be about 340 feet from uh, Route 2A to the existing multi-use path. Off-street parking and loading complies as proposed. Uh, there's not much opportunity for shared parking because the uses here are residential or senior living where they all have the same uh, peak demand times. And their bicycle parking, uh, both short-term and long-term, complies as proposed. Uh, guarantees and maintenance of required improvements. So before the next hearing, draft declarations of covenants, articles of incorporation, and bylaws must be submitted prior to the next hearing. Uh, these documents must specify the prohibited uses of wetlands and buffers, including mowing and limitations of tree clearing within a watershed protection buffer. The documents must also specify neighborhood park elements um, up required to uphold the growth management score including that the bicycle storage lockers need to be publicly accessible. We ask for this very specific language because typically when a development turns over to a homeowners association, um, it's important to show that lineage of why we have wetland buffer standards. No, you can't cut down the trees in the wetland buffer behind your condo unit and making it cl very clear in their documentation uh, for the associations to make sure that future bylaw conditions are upheld. On-site infrastructure, overall compliance as proposed. Um, however, for sidewalks, the DRB should consider a condition um, requiring a sidewalk alongside Townhome Unit 87 to provide a pedestrian connection from Beaudry Lane to the Primitive Trail. Um, where the multi-youth path, path was originally proposed, uh, the northern section of it went through wetland buffer and the state would prefer no incursion into the wetland buffer for a multi-use path. They're proposing a primitive trail um, so you could connect from the public park northward to Beaudry Lane and this sidewalk would encourage people um, to use the primitive path and avoid vehicle conflicts. Is that in a proposed conditions of approval? That is correct, yes. Okay. Uh, bus stop, uh, Green Mountain Transit is not interested in a bus stop at this time. Uh, there are existing bus stops nearby for Route 10 along Route 2A. Um, maintenance complies as proposed with the condition. Um, they have revised the lamp landscaping plan to show trash receptacles throughout the neighborhood uh, and solid waste. Um, the HAC has a recommendation to add windows for visual interest and ventilation on the solid waste building. Uh, final plans must also specify rooftop mechanical equipment and utility installations that they'll be screened from view. Uh, density transfer of development rights complies as proposed with the density of 7.5 DUE per acre. Uh, this density analysis actually leaves a couple DUE unclaimed uh, that could be proposed in a future phase. And no transfer of development rights is proposed. Uh, design review, so the HAC reviewed this application four times. 
Their comment memos that are included as conditions are very brief because through each iterative meeting, the applicant addressed the HACS comments. The outstanding comments left are add additional benches and picnic tables in the public park, provide windows on the solid waste building, and provide benches and seating along other sidewalks and multi-use paths. In the original submission, there were five benches shown on the path. When it got rerouted, those benches uh, were omitted and they will need to be included on final plans. Overall, the hack is pleased with um, the modern farmhouse style for the townhomes and carriages um, and the front porches and balconies on the apartment buildings. Landscaping complies as proposed. Uh, they've updated the plans to show tree protection around the existing trees, particularly where it abuts Chelsea Commons and Half Moon Circle. Um, as requested, they also showed the existing vegetation um, along the property line with the uh, Half Moon Circle units. Um, the portions of these landscaping um, areas, some of the existing trees are on the EAC property line are on EAC property and they're proposed to be retained in addition to adding plantings to meet the buffer requirements. Uh, street trees compliance is anticipated with the planting locations. Uh, there is a species diversity requirement that must be shown um, on the final plans. Uh, there is a note, but there needs to be that numerical calculation that no more than a certain number of species is planted um, throughout the neighborhood. Conservation areas complies as proposed. Uh, there is one very specific Conservation Commission recommendation uh, for bird boxes. This came out of the habitat disturbance assessment as a mitigation measure. Both the applicant and Conservation Commission agreed to that recommendation. Uh, watershed health also complies as proposed. As requested, the, hack, um, the applicant conferred with the State of Vermont Wetlands Division. Uh, the Wetlands Division said that they would prefer Cabot Lane and the multi-use path to not conflict with the wetland buffers, and that's why those elements were reconfigured. Um, the applicant also provided a functional assessment of Class Three wetlands and determined their value to be none or low. Signs in public art, um, standard signs could be approved administratively in the future, um, and impact fees will be paid on a per unit basis at time of administrative permit. Outdoor lighting uh, compliance is also anticipated and a condition is included. Uh, for the townhome units, um, those lighting specifications need to be included as well as for the pool house. Um, originally, there were some bollards proposed along the um, multi-use path, and the DRB should discuss lighting and bollards in the public park. So now that the path has moved away, the lighting's moved away, we're creating a public park that has a loop path, and the DRB should discuss lighting in that area. What follows is findings of fact, conclusions of law, and conditions of approval with highlights where the DRB um, may make edits at the future meeting. Thank you. Emily, thank you. Great job. Uh, Pete, sorry, can I just interrupt? Uh, I neglected to start the recording at the start of the meeting. It is going out live on YouTube and Zoom, so I'm just going to start it now if that's okay, so we can document this important discussion. Okay. okay. Recording in progress. Okay, thank you, Simon. Okay, Chris and team, um, I'd like you to, uh, so there's three parts to my request. So if you're an old guy like me, you wanna write this down. So uh, walk us through the, the changes that have taken place since, uh, since we last saw you that, that supplement what Emily did, not, not um, not a direct re repeat, but there's been considerable changes and, uh, and you've reacted to our comments, so thank you. Uh, and then I'd like you to walk us through uh, in, in some detail the, the public park, proposed public park, which parks, which is part of the changes, but I'd like you to do a little bit more of a deep dive on those. 
Um, and, uh, and again, thank you for reacting to our comments. And then lastly, I'd just like you to comment on the proposed conditions of approval. And if you have any, um, any things um, that cause you concern that you would like us to consider changing. And then anything else that you feel you, is, is applicable. No problem. Certainly not limited to that. Yeah, no problem. Well, great. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much uh, for your time this evening to review our application for the annex property. As you can tell, um, there has been a lot of uh, staff, select board, DRB, HAC, Conservation Commission have all allocated a lot of time to this proposed neighborhood. Um, and we do appreciate all the feedback and comments that we've received over the last several months. Uh, I would like to comment on that as well and say that, you know, I think that it's very important to note that uh, we have improved the project and I am very excited about what we have, where we have landed um, with this current uh, proposed application. Uh, we have made substantial changes uh, and we have taken that feedback and I think in the end we do end up with a better neighborhood um, and proposal here um, and so I do appreciate those comments. Uh, I will, uh, I had the plan of sort of discussing some of the changes in more detail so I don't know if, uh, Simon, if you could pull up the uh, concept plan. Um, uh, or the site plan, or Emily? Emily's Sorry. Control. Okay, yes. Um, so if you could, uh, I, th I think there, um, Emily did a very good job of reviewing a uh, majority of the uh, components that were discussed. I think if we start at Alpine Drive, the first substantial uh, improvement is the traffic signal that we've noted uh, in the application uh, at the intersection of 2A and Alpine Drive. And I, I do believe that that is beneficial for the proposed neighborhood and also addresses some concerns from some neighbors about access and also what would be the primary uh, means and egress of the uh, neighborhood. As you go further into the neighborhood, the public park has changed substantially um, and we do have Michael Busher here today to also be able to discuss in more detail what the ideas and themes were for the public park and so we'll certainly get into that discussion. The neighborhood park uh, is the next piece that uh, we have more formalized and created and what that is is essentially a uh, a pool, some outdoor eating facility, you know, like some t tables, uh, some gardening area, gardening beds, um, and some other, uh, and then the pool house uh, that would have some restrooms. It's going to have a small meeting room, probably a small little office uh, for property management, and then also some bike storage associated with the, uh, to, as, as required under the growth management. Um, and yeah, there's a better uh, view of all the ideas that we have added into that space um, and uh, excited about formalizing that area as a neighborhood park. Uh, I think along with the, the, those substantial changes, there's the elimination of Cabot Lane is probably a primary component uh, of this change uh, of this submission or updated submission. And that was brought upon both by uh, through discussion with uh, uh, the state with regards to crossing the wetland or wetland buffer on the western portion of the property um, and also uh, helps us uh, stay out of those buffers. So by relocating the uh, path there, what we did is we realized that we could actually eliminate the crossroad uh, that was between uh, Beaudry Lane and Alpine Drive. When we did that, it created the neighborhood park even better. Uh, it also allowed us, we flipped the senior housing building which is the center building there. Um, and that building 
uh, used to access off Cabot, and so we were able to flip that so that is now looking out over towards the neighborhood park um, and along Alpine Drive. The next piece is um, the adjustment of Eden Lane by the apartment buildings, and those uh, eliminating the uh, curved road, as Emily noted before, uh, created uh, uh, several changes um, that actually, I think, improved the overall uh, project layout. So Eden Lane is now a 90 degree bend, and the, it allows the sidewalk uh, along Eden Lane against the apartment buildings to be more squared up. And then it also created this open space in between the townhomes uh, that are uh, to the eastern side of that in the area that she just highlighted. So I think those pieces are all good things that have come of the result of uh, some of the feedback and comments that we've heard from both DRB HAC members, staff, and the Conservation Commission. Uh, those are really the substantial changes. And what I would say is it really doesn't change the overall feel of the neighborhood, the focus of the neighborhood, the product types within the neighborhood, but just change some of the road configurations and improved uh, all of those components. The other changes that we've updated is also the architectural designs of the townhomes. And so those um, townhomes, uh, this was based upon some comments from both the DRB and the HAC uh, with regards to uh, what the visual is along Alpine Drive. And so we shifted the um, decks that were located over the parking area to the front of the homes and I think it does create a much better streetscape. Uh, we are a bit challenged uh, with height in this product type just because they are three stories um, and the roof pitch. So the roof pitch is, is it's a slight roof pitch and then it's going to flatten out and peak out because we can't, uh, we are limited to 36 feet. Uh, there is a, we're following the, the regulation saying that uh, there's actually parking in those units uh, on the first floor uh, and we're not counting it as structured parking because I guess there's some discussion about whether or not uh, uh, any parking would be structured but we didn't want to veer too far from uh, what we thought was reasonable so we kept the parking on the first floor and we realized that the height is is the challenge there with the roof section but i think in the end by following more of the aesthetic of some of the other home types within the neighborhood was more important than figuring out the roof section like really making taller roofs so i would i would like to i don't want to interrupt chris but um i'd like to have a conversation in this forum about um, how we could um, classify that parking and if it would allow for uh, a slightly increased pitch um, using asphalt shingles with with uh, limited pitches in, in our climate is risky. Yes. And mm -hmm. so um, let's have that conversation after, after you're done, Chris. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, those were really the uh, big pieces uh, in changes that we made to the overall neighborhood um, and the site planning associated with it. Any ch questions about the proposed changes that we've made? No, uh, I, I don't. Um, other DRB members? No, I don't either. No, I'm just not. Okay. Uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna get the. No, I can't. It's a quick question. Was there a change in the total number of units when phase one and two are combined, or is the total unit count the same as it was before? Uh, Emily. The total unit count is the same as before. There was a typographical area error where it said 273, 
in units um, and was corrected to 276, but overall the same number of units for the building. Yes, thank you. Okay, continue, Chris. Yeah, so, uh, so those are the changes. So that's item number one that you had questions on. Item number two, I'm gonna let Michael Busher speak to that in, with regards to the park, because it is kind of a fun and different park. I think it is uh, unique. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that I have not seen anything designed of this um, uh, and pretty excited about what it looks like and how it could be uh, utilized uh, both by the public but also by the people within the neighborhood. So Michael, you want to speak on this? Sure. Um, hi, Michael Busher again with TJ Boyle Associates. Um, so uh, the Snyder companies asked us just to come in to specifically provide some some insight and design for 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 the park itself. Um, so we got a couple of different things going on. The path no longer goes through and respect the wetlands. Um, and what we've ended up with is a is a high point that's surrounded by wet meadows, more or less. Um, it's, it's pretty much a field around there, but the area of high ground is, is fairly wooded at the moment right now. So the idea would be that you, you come in off, off of the roadway and we've incorporated a series of art placements as well as interactive play areas. And then we've also used a, a entrance gateway to try to help bring people into the park. So when you're on the road, there's going to be one piece of art installation right near the road to spark interest and captivate people's attention, try to draw people and make them understand there's something back here that's sort of interesting. Um, then you, you pass through a more or less a entry structure. Um, yep, and it's got some seating in it. So again, pretty visible from the roadway. You continue along the path and there's going to be locations for two more art, art installations. And, and we were really thinking of more of a natural theme. It's a very natural area surrounded by all the wet meadows, but not just to keep it as a look at it, aesthetic art, but to create some interaction into it. We, we've identified really four locations of um, sort of, I'll call them play areas. And uh, w w there, there's hopping stumps, there's boulders, there's balance beams, there's mm -hmm. vertical poles. Um, the, uh, the, we envision that all the wood in these installations would be black locust, um, readily available in the area. It's been used a lot for this type of use. It's highly rot resistant. There's no chemicals to deal with. Um, both the, the wood installations as well as the stone installations also provide additional seating areas, gathering spaces within the project. Um, we've, we've dispersed them between areas that are fairly wooded within the park area and open areas. Um, we've also provided some more standard seating, some regular benches, a picnic table, um, some screening plantings to some of the adjacent uses and and hopefully um, one of the things that we talked about is doing an annual mowing in the wetland buffers which a and r is is um acceptable to just so fully grow over and get really um enclosed in the space we'd like to have some visibility into the space ongoing and um that's sort of where we landed um obviously the the Art sculpture pieces are just placeholders. We would um, engage with local artists to, to create sculptures for each of those locations. Um, we have some there's some really great stone art, stone mason artists in in Vermont, um, <coughs> nationally known. Um, Dan Snow being one of them. Um, so these are just ideas, and I would assume that there would have to be some sort of a process when we get through the actual design of the actual pieces that would be installed. Um, that's really the overview of it. Are there any questions?
And my, my only concern is the wood art um, projects in there and the longevity of them and like the maintenance of them. Uh, who would be doing that and stuff like that? If it's wood, it's not going to last forever. So, so uh, this uh, the entire neighborhood is going to be managed and maintained by a homeowners association. So it would be under their you know responsibility to do maintenance and repair as needed and if there's something that needs to be done for uh one of the art pieces it's going to just be part of their you know art and landscaping and pathways and stuff like that are going to be part of the yeah. hoa responsibilities and how are you denoting where the buffers for the wetlands are in this park so uh, that's a good question because that is always something um, that is comes up and we have talked about doing some delineation with well uh, on the western side you'll see it's uh, right on the buffer line there's some landscaping so that would be in that location in the other areas I think in the northern section there's an existing tree growth and uh, that would be you know maintained left as is on the southern portion and eastern portion i would think that we could either put in some rocks or boulders or something like that that delineate the edge of that buffer okay. any other questions drb members for in re regard to the proposed public parks uh, yes, Pete, I have one. Go ahead. So I'm looking at this plan and the, the, the trees that are kind of uh, outside of the wetland buffer, um, in, two of the little groves are inside the, the loop path. Are those existing trees that are going to remain? Yes. Are those to be planted? No, those are existing trees. Back, back in that area, there's a, a fairly dense grove of evergreens. Um, there, there is some... Um, <clears throat> There is a proposed stormwater line that will go through that area, so there will be some disturbance to that. But the idea would be to save a lot of that existing vegetation. So, okay, one one quick follow up. So, the water line is is that the, where it's marked FM there? Or, uh, oh no, where's the water line on here? It, it's a storm drain line. Oh, I see. It's I think that's, that's the D. So, and yeah. what's the F? What's the FM? line that I see on this plan towards the west. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to, um, to Trudell, but I believe that's in Fort Spain. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that, that's underground so, as well. Yeah, that's from yeah. the sanitary pump station. Okay, great, great, great. Yeah. So but back to the trees though. Um, well, so those are those are uh, thick evergreens. You say are are they going to be cleared out at all? Will there be ability for people to kind of walk with, with walk inside that grove under the trees, or is it going to be yeah, an edge? If you go out there today, of, I'm sorry. If you go out there today, they're they're pretty limbed up since they're mature. Um, the nature of evergreens is they they tend to drop their lower limbs. Right. So what I would anticipate that there would be some cleanup of that as well. And that would be the idea is that you know, on the ground plane, it would be fairly open, but there would be a canopy in. And all the different stems for the existing trees would, would play in with the uh, with, uh, with vertical um, wood sculpture play areas as well. Right. So that, that essentially becomes another, an additional kind of activity uh, element, it seems like. Yes. Yeah, that's great. That's all I had, Pete. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, Chris, anything else on public parks? Uh, I think we're satisfied. Okay. No, I have nothing else on public parks. Uh, okay. I just do on the pool. Mm -hmm. um, the, on the parking for the public the pool area, where will that be? So there's uh, well, residents hopefully will walk to it, uh, but then also in the front uh, along Alpine Drive, there are I believe eight parking spaces. Uh, identified along the front of the pool. Now, is there any ADA parking there? Uh, we cert. I would assume that we would have a uh, or one or two. Yeah, there, there's not proposed right now, but we could create some ADA parking. There. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be that'd yeah. be a good idea. Okay. Yeah. Any 
Anything else, Dave? Nope, that's it for that. Okay, proposed conditions. So, proposed conditions, we have reviewed them, and I just wanted to do one, I did one quick little check in here. Um, and we are, uh, have no changes to the pro proposed conditions um, that have been outlined by uh, the staff. Great. I would like to say that I, I do think, and I understand you started out the hearing saying that I that, that it was going to be continued. I, I do believe that uh, I'm not sure how much, how many, like, I, I guess I don't understand, uh, or what are the items that the DRB and the staff feel that, that are outstanding or that need to be discussed further? And so I guess I'd prefer if you close the hearing tonight, but I understand that if you choose not to, that's fine. I just, I think we've done a pretty uh, reasonable job, pretty good job uh, getting uh, all the data and all the information is required since our July hearing together. So just a request. You've done an exceptional job. I don't say that lightly. Yeah, it's strictly you. a matter of allowing um, Williston <laughs> departments to weigh in yes and so it's nothing about your prepared package it's about allowing uh, adequate time internally to get feedback from uh, Department of Public Works and uh, fire department yes. and so um, we need to give them time they haven't weighed in this is a big proposal um, we've checked in with them uh, well, Emily has, and we feel like uh, they can meet, they can provide comments, which would be done um, with the stipulated time frame to get them to you. And we'll have an opportunity to, to discuss those um, on October 11th. And the plan is that those will be available. We can have a discussion that night that probably will be limited to whatever input they provide. Um, and the DRB will deliberate that night. Okay. So that's that's the reason. Your your package was, we recognize the amount of work that you put into this. Yeah, absolutely. Our team was So where's the snow, where is the snow storage piles going to be for these uh, little brown development? Townhouses with those things called the townhomes. Yeah, where, 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 where's the snow room uh, storage going to be for that? Plow it out of there. Uh, so there's there's definitely some areas in between, you know, the four and six unit buildings where there's islands that uh, protrude out. Um, and the reality, you know, there's some snow storage on the eastern side of the property as well, uh, right where Emily's got her uh, arrow right now. Um, there would be some snow storage there. There's some snow storage in between the different buildings, and then you know probably some in between the in the that where the recreational path is. You know there are some areas yep. throughout all of those spaces. Yeah, and we we've called that out on sheet C10-01. Although we didn't call out all the smaller areas, we kind of pointed out the bigger areas there. But as Chris stated, it would be kind of in between the driveways kind of where the multi-use path is and along the ends of the, on either end of the development, Eden Lane and Beaudry Lane. Anything else, Paul? Mm -hmm. Mom? Dave? No. John? Comments? If he's talking, he's muted. I'm okay. sorry. I, 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 I was muted. Okay. Um, I was coughing before, so I thought I'd spare you. Um, the, uh, no, I have no, no further questions here. Okay. Thank you, John. Okay. We're going to transition to public uh, comments at this point. Oh, do we want to uh, do the structured parking? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, there is a provision in the bylaws 
that allows for uh, additional height. Um, Chris, you're very familiar with that. And, um, and I wanted to have a, a review of what the bylaws say, um, not in the spirit of, of dramatically increasing the height, but maybe, um, maybe looking if the bylaws allow for a few more feet to allow a little more pitch on those roofs, um, which I just think is um, something we should we should consider. So, so Emily, uh, walk us through the bylaws, if you would, please. Yeah. What one quick piece before talking about that? The other component that's really playing into this discussion as well is the utilization of the uh, we we take the grade from the sidewalk in front is that correct it's averaged across all sides of the structure it's average finish grade so when we have a six unit building and it's uh, 120 feet long it's the middle so we're going to have this like the, the there is grade in the road that also plays into this and we may uh, so i just think that height is also important because we've had to take that into consideration to sort of peg it so that it's not we, we don't have a building that exceeds on one end and actually might be lower on the other end do you see what i'm saying so it's the average it's the average it's the average and that's what the bylaws state so uh, if you have a group of six correct me if i have this wrong but well, why don't, why don't you just read yeah. it? Yeah, sorry. And, and no, that's important. Yeah. And because if you if you took if if you didn't take the average, we we might be able to um, we might be able to accomplish what I think you and I both want, which is to slightly increase the pitch of the roof a little bit. So. Uh, the bylaw for Taft Corner Zoning District says the height limit will be increased from 36 to 52 feet where perpetually affordable housing and or structured parking are provided. <coughs> uh, for the structured parking, um, provide 30% or greater of its parking requirement in a structure resulting in a commensurate reduction in surface parking and loitering areas. So the staff interpretation focuses on commensurate reduction in surface parking and loading areas. Typically, a basement level shared garage where you no longer need a surface parking lot for all your parking, you can serve it um, underground and sharing a loading area, i.e. one point in and out. Whereas townhomes, duplexes, single family homes, they don't share the same loading areas and it's not necessarily resulting in a reduction of surface parking because in front of every garage there's one to two parking spaces. So the staff interpretation has been to look at basement level parking, not individual garage units. Uh, building height is defined as the vertical de distance measured from the average elevation of the finished grade immediately adjacent to the building to the highest point on the roof. And a building is defined as a structure that is permanently tied to the ground by footings or a foundation and that has a roof. So we would look at that grouping of four to six units as one building because it shares one foundation. Okay, so so Chris, be, between now and October 11th, um, you and your team please look at what the average elevation is and how that relates to the roof pitches because uh, based on uh, the regulations, we don't have the flexibility to consider that to be uh, structured parking. Agreed. And so, I mean, it just doesn't fit the definition. And if we were to get creative in our interpretation, uh, which is not the way we we do things here, um, we would be opening and subjecting ourselves to um, some some problems on other applications. And so, um, so I'd ask you to, to do a thoughtful analysis of how you're calculating the elevations and, uh, and we can continue that discussion on October 11th. Standing seam is very nice for semi-flat roosts. 
Um, what is what is the roof pitch right now as it stands? Oh, uh, so I think it's a five and one for a certain distance, and then it basically flattens out from there. And it's probably going to be a rubber membrane or something like that in that flat sections. So the so what you see will be that little section, but then it's flat, and you won't really be able to see that. So we haven't finalized all the little details, but we've had to work through it quite a bit. And, and what is the average height of, of the, the floors? So they are eight, nine, and nine. Okay. okay. So eight, is that, uh, I'm sorry, nine, nine, and nine. So first, mm -hmm. first floor is nine foot, which is the garage, right? So it's a, it's not a product that we see a lot built in a three-story product um, with a garage underneath. And then second floor, which is living space, is nine. And then third floor is nine. Uh, okay, so yeah, we 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 don't try to design things, but I, I like I like where Paul was going on that is uh, for you to think about think about standing seam, which is which is better for <coughs> lower pitches. Are those wind? I'm sorry. Are those windows and the underneath the balconies? Are those the the back end of the garage? So that's actually uh, like living space or square footage. Okay. Um, and then the garage is, so it's like a office study, maybe a bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, and then living space above that. Okay, so those are real windows into a real living space, not- That's correct. Not to see someone's garage. No. Great, okay, thank you. How deep are the balconies there? Looks like maybe four feet, five feet. I think they're five feet out to the outside edge, John. Okay. It just you, you just have to be careful. It's a great spot, the balcony. It just if you get too big, it, it becomes kind of this deadly sh shaded, shadowy space underneath that nothing wants to grow in. Okay, so that's all. I was just checking. Okay, um, so I think we've um, I think we've explored the uh, the parking and uh, and the bylaw review. And Chris, I think you and your team have a, <coughs> a homework assignment. If uh, if I could be so bold as to no problem. have homework assignment, uh, uh, you know, give out homework assignments, but I think that would be a good one to do. And uh, so we're going to transition to public comments now. Before we do that, I want to turn it over to Emily to uh, just give us a little refresher of what uh, the DRB can influence and what is outside of, um, of our area of influence. So Emily, if you do that, please. Yeah, uh, so the DRB's focus is on the unified development bylaws, which uh, have mandates around, you know, what we've been talking about, building height, number of units per the density analysis, landscaping, outdoor lighting, some design review. And the DRB's authority uh, tends to fade out when you get to the street design. So they're guided by the public work specifications in terms of um, intersection design, uh, street and lane width, and then where uh, roads interact with a state highway, in this case Route 2A, those streets and intersections are the jurisdiction of the Vermont Agency of Transportation. Um, Initially, in this application process, staff on behalf of uh, the town commenting department's public works fire submitted a comment memo to VTrans asking that they look more closely at the intersection design for Alpine Drive and Beaudry Lane, uh, with they ha which they have, and that intersection was upgraded to 
a public street or, um, to a traffic signal um, and those streets um, are beyond the DRB's jurisdiction to influence their design um, the bylaw does call for connectivity between neighborhoods um, and here the DRB has very limited authority because Chelsea Commons when that was subdivided had a plat um, that gave that irrevocable offer to the town for that right of way to the future property um, so gated access or one-way access those are things that are not in the zoning bylaws or the public work specifications that the DRB could require and things like where on street parking is and is not located vehicle speeds other traffic calming measures those are other select board ordinances and policies that the DRB does not have jurisdiction over okay thank you Emily so uh, so let's segue into the public input phase and uh, if you're on Zoom, uh, raise your virtual hand uh, and Simon will uh, unmute you. If you're here, here uh, in the room, um, please uh, one at a time come forward to, uh, to this chair here uh, where the public placard is. And uh, we want to hear from you. Uh, but we ask that um, your comments be limited to something that is supplemental to any written uh, documentation that's already been submitted uh, and, and keep, keep it limited to things that the DRB can influence, please. Um, so with that, uh, who would like to go first? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Carol Laws. I live on 244 Dunmore Lane, Williston, Vermont, and I am an abutter to the Annex project. Um, I want to talk about three related topics, energy conservation, infrastructure, ownership, and maintenance. And I realize that some of these things don't relate exactly to DRB, so hopefully you'll give me that opportunity to briefly discuss those. Um, the second is traffic on Route 2A, and the third is traffic on Dunmore Lane slash Chelsea Place, the access to and from the annex. The first item is energy conservation, infrastructure, ownership, and maintenance. I would like to read you an email I sent to Emily on 9922. Emily has responded to these 10 items and I'm sure you have a copy of her email. And some of the items I know do not pertain to the DRB. So but before you do that, uh, this is part of our, this is part of the public record, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so if you, if, if you would please summarize and not, and not read them verbatim, that would be appreciated. I'll do my best. Thank you. Uh, this email was written on 9922 uh, to, to Emily, and it's entitled the Annex. And my primary purpose of writing this was to point out things that have come about as I live in Finney Crossing that might be of importance that could be done different or better in, in the Annex. Uh, for example, uh, are there 100 amp charging devices for EVs being provided in all of the units? And if so, is the electrical distribution transmission grid sized accordingly? Solar. Individual homes should be given the option for solar panels. Multi-family, multi-story buildings should have solar panels. Building envelopes. Ceilings and walls of garages should be insulated. Triple pane windows and doors should be provided on all exterior pass doors. One of the things that's happened in Finney Crossing is there were no, to my knowledge, uh, storm doors provided and probably more than half of the community has put them in at considerably more expense than had they been put in by the developer. Uh, public streets and private streets. Uh, we have several private streets in Finney Crossing. And my concern about those is that 
you are asking homeowners to maintain and replace these streets and they probably aren't qualified to do it and if they do do it they probably will not get the best price so I don't I'm not in favor of private streets I think that in a development like this that all the streets ought to be public streets uh, for example one of the public one of the private streets in our development doesn't have any curves and it's on a slope and what tends to happen is you get washouts at the edge of the street and you get snow plows plowing the, the sod away from the edge so you know at the very least if you're going to put in private streets build them to the same standard as the public streets so that these kind of things don't happen we have a wastewater pump station it's on a private street uh, it serves uh, five or six units and I'm very much aware that the town's policy is uh, if you that the town will maintain and repair and replace pump stations if it if you have 200 hookups or well, we don't have anywhere near 200 hookups the problem here is that again we don't have people who are capable or talented uh, to maintain these things and, and our pump station did overflow and it went into somebody's uh, basement and it cost thirty thousand dollars to clean it up so my hope would be that in a development like this that pump stations could be handled by the town rather than by individual owners. Um, street lights. Uh, I'm not sure what the policy is as far as street lights are. I live on Dunmore Lane and there are no street lights. It's a very dark street and I would encourage uh, the DRB to put street lights in on as many streets as you possibly can. I would encourage you to look at uh, solar street lights, which are used a lot in the western part of the country, uh, which probably are less expensive to install. Uh, that pretty much covers that aspect of it, where I'm talking about energy conservation, I'm talking about things that you could do in a development to make it more uh, uh, less expensive for homeowners to, to, to live in and uh, and, and better all around. The second thing I want to talk about is traffic on Route 2A. My email to the DRB on 7-18-22 questioned the conclusion of the traffic consultant that no traffic signals were required at either the Alpine Drive or the Baudry Lane exits onto Route 2A. I'm happy that Chris Snyder recommend, recommended, and I believe VTrans and the town have agreed to install traffic signals in a southbound left turn lane at the Alpine Drive exit. I did make two recommendations above and beyond what VTrans was recommending. And those are, uh, and it's easier for me to read, this is fairly quick. I have several comments regarding the attached report from Christopher Clow of VTrans. Mr. Clow has recommended post monitoring of Baudry Lane at 50% and full build out. I would also add Alpine Drive and Zephyr Road for that monitoring. I would also recommend a northbound right turn lane at Alpine Drive. The reason for the above two recommendations is because of the extremely heavy traffic on Route 2A. And as many of you know, if you've traveled it, it's not unusual to see almost solid traffic from Taft Corners to Five Corners. So I think you need to do everything you can to ease traffic and that additional uh, turn lane at Alpine Drive could certainly help that. So that covers my thoughts on the Route 2A uh, intersection. The next thing I want to talk about in some detail is the Dunmore Lane Chelsea Place access to and from the annex. The revised traffic study dated 9-12-22 with traffic signals and southbound left turn lane at Alpine Drive, as expected, increases traffic onto Route 2A and decreases traffic at the Dunmore Lane Chelsea Place exit. The peak hour traffic, PHT, changes are as follows. Baudry Lane, original 15, revised 22. So the traffic count went up. 
Alpine Drive original 77, new revised went to 110. A significant increase in the number of vehicles that probably will use Alpine Drive. And consequently, and nicely, the Chelsea Place went from 68 to 32, and Dunmore Lane went from 24 to 14. The 32 and the 14 were not provided by the in the revised traffic report, so I simply interpolated those uh, from the original report to get the 32 and the 14. This is a welcome reduction as far as Dunmore Lane and Chelsea Place, but it is still very high and unacceptable. Chelsea Place would be, a, would, would be one vehicle every 30 seconds and Dunmore Lane one vehicle every four minutes. As I have said before, many of the Chelsea Place trips will change to Dunmore Lane as there are many vehicles parked on both sides of the street at Chelsea Commons. I've also said before that the way to solve this problem is to limit or eliminate the Dunmore Lane Chelsea Place exit. I've been told several times by Emily, speaking for the town, that this can't be done. I spent considerable time researching the town rules and regulations and must respectfully disagree with this conclusion. I offer my email to Emily dated 9-13-22, which I will read and I apologize it's fairly long. Uh, that email is entitled the Annex and the brackets Dunmore slash Chelsea access close brackets. Begins, hi Emily, I am attaching a three page report concerning the Dunmore slash Chelsea access where respectfully I must disagree with some of the conclusions you, speaking for the town, have made. Based on current traffic projections for the annex, there will be a very substantial increase in traffic in Finney Crossing and Chelsea Commons, creating, in my opinion, undue levels of traffic congestion and unsafe conditions on our respective streets. I strongly believe that our street systems were not designed for, the, for these traffic volumes that are projected. There is a major difference in traffic volumes for a church versus a 343 unit residential development. And I ask to please pass this on to the DRB. So this is, you'll have to bear with me if you will please. Here is the three page report that was sent to Emily and consequently the board. Hi Emily, I want to discuss three items relative to the Dunmore Lane slash Chelsea oh, Place oh, access. Mr. Laws, you're, you're, not, you're not intending to read three pages of, of testimony that's already in our that's already in the public record, are you? Well, I am, and the reason I want to do it is because there are a number of people listening on Zoom, and there may be some people here in the audience who haven't seen this or heard this, and so it's a way to inform them. I'll be I, as rapid I, and as quick I, as I, I can. I appreciate that, but I, I think what we what we tried to set the, I've, I've given you great latitude, okay, because because I'm a Willistonian, you're a Willistonian, we're all neighbors, it's, 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 uh, I, I try to run these meetings in a very respectful Vermont way, um, but we, but but we as a body, the DRB, cannot influence the 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 traffic, um, the 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 traffic reconfiguration that you are referencing, and uh, and and I, we specifically ask that that we make that we keep comments to things that we can influence. And, Will you let me I, summarize it in a couple of sentences? I, please, please do that. Um, I have read and reread the regulations that pertain to this. And the regulations over and over and over again say this should be done. This is a goal. They do not say it must be done. And I've written many specifications in my life and there is a major difference between should and must and shall. And so as I read these regulations, decisions have been made and, and under, uh, with these regulations which say things should be done. They don't say they must be done. They over and over and over again say safety is a concern. Safety is a concern. If if you, do this reg if you do this regulation, safety is a concern. So what my contention is that the town has held pretty solid that there's not going to be a change in the 
Dunmore Lane, Chelsea Place Road, roadway connecting connecting the, the uh, annex. And they're saying it's because of the regulation. And I'm saying the regulation says should. It's a goal. It was made 15 years ago, uh, and it and the times have changed dramatically. And really, you ought to relook at it. And that's what I'm asking you to do in as briefly as I can. And I appreciate that opportunity. The last thing I'd like to do is to uh, read two short uh, emails that were sent to the town expressing very nicely the concerns of residents of Chelsea Commons and uh, Penny Crossing. The first one is from Cassie Fodor. She lives at 80, at 80 Chelsea Place, Williston. She says, Dear Miss Heyman, my name is Cassie Fodor and I am the owner of 80 Chelsea Place property in Williston. I am writing to express my serious traffic concerns re related to the proposed Annex Snyder development in Williston. I'm extremely concerned about the envisioned amount of cars that are expected. And I'll briefly put This is a suburban development with kids playing basketball riding bikes, people walking dogs, jogging, and the suspected increase in traffic, which realistically may be even worse, is going to ruin this neighborhood. This is not what the residents want or need. We fear this increased traffic, in addition to ruining our community and neighborhood, will also increase the risk of personal injuries. And she goes on to say that she requests that the Dunmore Lane uh, Chelsea Place exit be eliminated, or if it's there, there will be some requirement, some limitations on it. The second letter is from Stephanie and George Barrett, and it goes, my husband George and I reside at 110 Dunmore Lane and own 176 Dunmore Lane, where my elderly parents live. We are concerned about the influx of traffic that potentially may run onto Dunmore Lane due to the proposed annex project. This is a major safety issue. We already have issues with motorists driving too fast on this road. Now we may have more to worry about. My father, an 89-year-old, walks with a cane and must cross Dunmore Lane to get to the mailbox. I worry about cars racing through. He couldn't react fast enough to get out of the way if necessary. Children are on bikes, scooters, and walking in the roadway and sidewalks. They don't pay attention to cars. I can't even begin to guess how many people walk their dogs through Finney Crossing and Chelsea Commons. Lastly, most of the residents on Dunmore Lane are older and must either back out or into their driveway, which again is a reaction time issue. More traffic light allowed onto Dunmore Lane is a serious issue. We ask that you please, please consider not allowing more vehicles to access to Dunmore Lane via the Annex Project except for emergency vehicles, signed Stephanie and George Barrett. So, I think I've demonstrated that the town has the right and thus the obligation to review the decision that was made some 15 years ago on Dunmore Lane, Chelsea Place exit. And if you agree with me, then you can either eliminate it, which I don't expect is going to happen, but you could eliminate it or you can put some limitations on it and you all know that I've made some suggestions on what those limitations could be. So thank you so much for, for listening to me and putting up with me. And uh, I certainly hope that this board and this community is listening to the people in Finney Crossing and Chelsea Commons who have very serious concern about a significant amount of additional traffic that's going to come onto streets that weren't designed for it and that you will hopefully do something about it. So anyway, thank you so much for listening to me and, and I look forward to hearing your results and your comments. Thank you. Okay, next <coughs> member of the public who would like to speak. Good evening, if you would state your name and address for the record, please. I'm Carl Fowler. I reside at 178 Meadow Run Road in the Meadow Run community. 
I'm the former president of the Meadowrun Association, but I am not speaking for the association tonight, I'm speaking for myself. I want to start by saying that I think there's been a remarkable improvement in this proposal, and many of the elements that are now are really very first rate. And I thank you for that, and I applaud it. And most of my comments, unfortunately, devolve into the areas that you sort of outlined as being off-lens as well. But I think all of us need to think about these developments that are coming as a grouping, not necessarily always individually. The biggest problem that I see with the existing proposal before us has nothing to do with its internal design. It has to do with the inevitable impacts of it combined with the 70 plus unit development proposed for the Trinity Baptist Church property, the 15 unit development proposed by Michaud for the distance between the Meadow Run neighborhood and Mountain View, the new development we just talked about that would go in where the golf course was. As an aggregate, all of these are going to funnel an immense amount of additional traffic into the intercities of Mountain View Industrial Way and Route 2A. And yet we seem to continuously deal with the fringes of a traffic light with a left turn lane and not deal with the fundamental question is how much traffic can that infrastructure stand and should we proceed with this many projects until we've done something to upgrade the infrastructure to make it work. It is not atypical at all to see traffic backed up from Mountain View all the way past the credit union which would take it past Alpine now. If you put another light there you're going to create further interruptions in that and even further slow the traffic down. Beaudry Lane will be, as it is now with Meadow Run, virtually impossible to exit or enter from, depending on the direction of travel on Route 2A, during rush periods, because there will almost always be traffic lined up in front of it. <laughs> the Meadow Run neighborhood is going to be opened up not as a cul-de-sac neighborhood as this will be, except for the outlet uh, down into Chelsea Place, but it will be opened up as a through neighborhood when White River Water is extended through the Michaud development up to Mountain View. That will make us very similar to Zephyr Road, which is an alternative to going through the lights at Taft Corners. All of these are issues which may not be within the purvey of the Development Review Board to veto, but they ought to be within your purvey to make comment on and suggest to the Select Board that they ought to be looked at again and possibly select or suggest revisions or timing changes to try to deal with the impact of these projects. My other comment is much simpler, but it is one that I was deeply disappointed in. I've been a public transit advocate for 60 years, and I was astounded to hear GMT say, as reported in the documents you shared tonight, that they see no need for a bus stop at a location that's going to be serving a senior housing community and which provides access to the nearest shopping that's available without a car uh, and which will be very difficult to exit on foot at certain times of the day. I think we need to go back and say we want a bus stop there and whether or not again it's the development review board perhaps it's something the Snyder development should be doing itself. If there's going to be senior housing there there ought to be provision for public transit those seniors could use. With that I thank you. Thank you. And I'm done. Thanks. Uh, next member of the public that would like to speak. Uh, if you're on Zoom and you would like to speak, please do raise your hand. I'm not seeing any hands at the moment. No, no hands raised on Zoom. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, thank you for those thoughtful comments from both of you. Uh, DRB members, any uh, final questions before we continue? John? No. Okay. Uh, Chris and team, any? Andy? There's a couple of items raised in the staff report that the DRB wants to weigh in tonight or weigh in via staff. Uh, they didn't raise the question. Um, all of the lighting along the path after the public park. I think the applicant's opinion on that is it's a relatively not remote, but removed from the development area. Uh, it's not intended for use at night, and we prefer not that bother with any along that area. Um, and then I think one of the other things that staff had raised was just DRB comments on the number of benches and picnic tables in the public park, as well as the number of benches along the path. And I think you know, we can certainly add some benches along the path that replace Cabot Lane and maybe pull a couple of the swings in the neighborhood park over so that you're and better proximity to the path to be used by you know, both, both sets of users. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Chris and team? 
No? Okay. Uh, so it is 8.47. Uh, we are going to continue DP 21-18 to October 11th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gather your stuff. Thank you very much. That's good. Thank you. is DP 22-06 Green State Realty LLC. If you would state your name and address for the record, please. Anastasia Dyna for Green State Realty 4626 Williston Road, Williston Vermont 05495. Carl Marshall, Leary Burke 13 Corporate Drive, Essex Junction, Vermont 05452. Okay, uh, staff is up. Melinda. Um, this is a request for discretionary permit to do this by the new use of carbon ownership, construct a new building parking outdoor sales and related apartments in this at 46 26 Williston Road. Grading and earth removal is, re is required. The site is, is currently developed in a single story multi tenant building and unpaved storage lot. The project was prevented presented to the DRB on August 23rd, 2022 and continued to September 27th, 2022 to allow the applicant time to resubmit materials addressing several areas of concern. Um, staff is recommending that the DRB deliberate and approve the proposed project with conditions as drafted. Um, so, uh, since the last hearing, um, no boards have reviewed the project. Um, uh, again, a second time, the HAC did review it um, prior to the first hearing. Um, the Department of Public Works and Fire Department did not have any additional comments, um, and their original comments are included. Um, one comment letter was received at the time of mail out. Um, the letter requests the applicant to provide a temporary construction easement along the front of the property to benefit lot four for construction of the sidewalk in this area. I will get into that with um, in, in greater detail further on. Um, so there were. I've listed the recommendations that were made at pre-app and the DRB recommendations that were discussed at the hearing um, on 823 um, and the applicant's response. Um, and I will uh, get into those as um, I go through the staff report. Um, and I'm really just going to focus on the changes that have been made in response to, to the DRB concerns. Yeah, if, um, you, if, if, you, if you could do that and also focus uh, so that we can streamline this, if uh, focus on anything that remains non-compliant. Sure. Um, so outdoor sales and storage are, is now compliant with the bylaw. Um, the applicant site plan is designating a six uh, six thousand four hundred ten square foot area for outdoor sales. Um, the for access connectivity, um, pedestrian access uh, has been improved by the inclusion of a walkway in front of the building um, and. 
Also, uh, the comment letter that I referred to was submitted by a representative um, from SD Ireland, who is the owner and developer of a budding lot four. They are constructing a sidewalk along the frontage of their property, um, as was recommended at pre-application. Um, and they would like to continue that sidewalk to connect to the VTrans sidewalk. Um, in order to do that, they would have to cross through a, a portion of this subject property. So they are requesting an easement for construction of that sidewalk along Route 2 to connect to the planned sidewalk. Um, okay, so let's let's have a conversation about that with the applicant while that's while you're referencing that. Yeah. Uh, do you have any objection to that? I talked to Mick from SD Ireland. He contacted me. I told him we didn't have a problem at all. I just asked him how much room he needed, and then just to let us know, and we obliged and you know update the permit for you know the final. And he said, okay, that's great. So I think we're we're all set with it. Okay, great. Uh, the only note that I make is. Uh, on proposed conditions of approval number 21. Um, I think that we ought to put the word temporary easement, the word temporary in front of easement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because uh, cause that's not a permanent easement. Temporary easement for construction, yep. Yep, yep. So we'll uh, <clears throat> we'll clean that up. Yeah. Okay. That sounds great, thank you. Okay, continue, Melinda, please. Sure. Um, so the for vehic vehicular parking, um, the ADA space is, has now been shown on the site plan, so that complies. Um, the site plan now shows one long-term bicycle parking space and one end-up trip facility in the interior of the building, so that complies. Um, the applicant has increased the size of the dumpster from uh, 8 by 16 to 10 by 20. And, uh, Snow storage area is now shown on the northeast side of the parking area. Um, for act recommendations, the site plan, as I stated, includes a walkway between the front of the building and the parking spaces so customers can safely access the main entrance. The floor plan includes an airlock at the main entrance. Um, the other hack recommendations are not uh, requirements of the bylaw. Rooftop mechanical, if proposed, must be demonstrated on, on the architectural elevations and screened in compliance with WDB 1812. Um, for landscaping, the applicant has updated the site plan to demonstrate compliance with the standard uh, now showing delineating the outdoor sales area in blue. Um, it's calculated the square footage of that sales area and has provided um, landscaping that equals 5% uh, of that sales area. Um, and uh, staff is recommending the DRB not require landscaping along the western boundary, which abuts another industrial site. Um, and let's see, I think that was, yeah, and then the lighting, um, the outdoor lighting can comply. Um, the applicant has provided information about timing and duration of lighting. Um, they are requesting that the lights, um, the lights stay on all the time at 10% power uh, for security reasons. So in order to, for the DRB to approve that, they would need to find, make a finding that the security needs of the site warrant um, this security lighting to be on all the time. Um, and I think that is all that I have. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Nice job with the resubmission. Well, I think Melinda was super helpful. I got this email here that I could share with you on the 13 bullet points, but basically we got an email representative of the of board's, you know, requirements, and, you know, I, I got 13 of them, and I could go down through them, but we, uh, we're meeting all 13. Yeah. On the lighting, I talked to my client about it. Super important for us is, uh, and the preset is five minutes, and... I, I could regurgitate exactly what's written, but she basically took my email and copied and pasted, and we can read it for the record if you'd like, but here's the gist of it. 
Um, if at 2 o'clock in the morning somebody's doing something mischievous to their cars, the light's going to turn on full power and that's going to allow their security lighting, which we're not telling anybody where it's going to be, but the intention is we're going to pick up some bad guys if somebody's doing something to the cars. Now, we don't want that, but that's really the only way that security lighting works is at full power. So somebody triggers a light, the lights, you know, are picked up. So, it, it, you know, towards the front of the building, if there was going to be any vandalism or anything like that. Not that we want that to happen, and we're and in a high-profile area, but that's the intention. And so. after the light triggers, how long does it stay on before it goes back to the minimum? It's a five-minute preset, and then it goes back to just five, five. Five minutes. We well, can change that. I would think but, you'd want a little more than five minutes. Just we yeah, can but, change it. Yeah, it's, but just, it's just a setting on a light. But any, any movement, it would be approved. Any movement, it re, re, re approved. Something yeah. similar okay. on the other There's side. There's talks of movement. I think it's it's going to stay on full yeah. time. I, I don't. Does does any member of the DRB have any issue with no. with what's being proposed? I think it makes total sense. No, no, I, absolutely. I, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I was saying, yeah. that, do you want more time? Well, the, the, the ten percent is actually like, um, it's just something that the sensor like. It, it's just it's being requested on a lot of projects that we're working on. It just so happens like all the guys at the office are like, oh, yeah, you should do this because in other towns like that's sort of the go-to thing. This uh, you know this sensor. So, anyways, that's why I talked to my client and we thought that was the best for for the use. Okay. For, John for or, John Hamilcar, are you good with this? I'm fine with it. Okay, okay. Uh, so you're 13 to 13. <laughs> yep. Uh, we just had a discussion about the illumination. Uh, you just heard that the board was in 100% agreement with your approach. Is there anything else? No, I mean, unless, unless you want to go through thir 13 items that, no. like you said, I, we're I, good. I don't. Oh, okay. good. Uh, yep, I just saying. Uh, okay, so uh, DRB members, um, if you have questions, uh, Paul? Existing water service to be removed? I don't quite understand that. Well, there's a little water service that goes to the green building. So, you know, we're basically going to cut, replace, run brand new to the new building. That's it. Oh, because I'm just saying the way that was written, it was like existing water service removed. I'm going, like, where are you going to get water from then? No, no, no. Okay. We're, we're going to cut, you know, right at the valve, and then we're going to bring brand new right to the building. Okay. Scott, that's question? A, uh, it's more of a statement. Um, so so you're, you're telling us you're a car dealership. That's great. Um, no storage of damaged vehicles on the site. No. Yep. In the record. So we're in agreement. I mean, number one, we said it right in there. Cars oh, must gonna, be that's sale ready. Up. That's going to show up in your yep. in your conditions of approval. Our cars. Yep. No, we're good with it. Okay. And we stated that right in the first bullet. Yep. So, I don't know. Nope. I'm just we're, confirm, confirming nope. it for the record. Nope. I, you're good yeah. with it. Yeah. yeah, we're good with it. I'm good. No problems. Uh, it's a great looking project. It's yeah. It's no, no, we're we're super excited about yeah. seeing a fresh look there. I, I really I really like the building. I like I, the, I like the effort you put into it. I think it's gonna be a great improvement. <laughs> Anything's gonna be an improvement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a portal that would be well, you know, the building's uh, you know <laughs> it's, it's just time. You know? Just just don't sell just don't sell uh, asphalt uh, dump trucks there. I don't know. Uh John, any party comments? No, how could I top for anything that you guys have already said? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody uh, <coughs> on Zoom in the public that would like to make a comment? Uh, please do raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment. I think we just outlasted everybody. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nothing wrong with going. Nothing wrong with going last. Everybody's asleep on the board. Yeah. So there's no raised hands. It's too bad I don't have a tougher project because it's like, hey, man, we're on 13 for 13. We're not asking for anything. Uh, okay. So, uh, so uh, it's 9.01. Uh, I'm going to close DP 22-06. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Emily, I need your guidance. We have uh, on the agenda the under communications, final plans, and other business. Uh, final plan review of Vermont oh, yeah. Hotel Group, LLC. Yeah, uh, the is here tonight on yeah. Zoom as well. Great, so let's, uh, so let's do that now before we go into the deliberations. Is that appropriate? Yeah, that sounds good. I'm okay. The So this is final plan to review for the exterior uh, materials at the Blair Park Hotel currently under construction. 
uh, the HAC reviewed the revisions last week and uh, provided comment that they preferred uh, the HAC, uh, the staff options, uh, which simplified the materials on the east elevation of the building. That's the side that does not have the main entrance. Um, and the applicant has provided um, uh, renderings um, in response to those, that comment. Um, and staff recommends approval. Okay, so does, uh, does, do DRB members uh, understand the little nuances here? Did, were you able to piece it together? Yes. Okay, because I, cause I uh, very much like what is, uh, has been proposed and recommended by the DRB. It, uh, it, it ties the, the west and the east together. Uh, there's symmetry on the east side. Um, it's nice building materials. It's an important building. I, uh, uh, is anybody opposed to a, approving this? No. Um, no, no, Pete, I'm not. I'm not opposed to approving it, but I'm. I'm. I'm confused on what we're approving, um, because there's a, a. There was in the original packet that I received an option A, and an option B. And then there was some additional information sent out today that also was an option A and an option B, but they were different than the option A's and B's here. So as far as I can tell, there's four, there's four suggestions here, and I, I'm totally unclear on what it is that the applicant is asking us to approve. Uh, thank you, John. So the applicant had originally submitted options A and option B. Um, the hack did not like the busyness of the proposed east elevation. Uh, this gable is on a flat wall, whereas the, the west elevation bumps out. Um, so the hack wanted the east elevation, which is being shared now, to be a sim more simple. Um, I mocked up a sketch with literally PowerPoint um, to help the hack understand what they they were, what they were thinking about, um, and the hack said, "Okay, go go for one of these options." The main difference is where it splits from stone to the cream uh, panel, yeah. and then the applicant. What you received today, the applicant submit submitted a official version of that option one, which is shared now, splits the stone um, yeah. between the windows. That's and then option two splits the stone along the windows right alongside. And I think the DRB is to decide between option one and two of what was submitted it, today. And that's staff one. That's option two. That's option two. two. That's option two. Okay. I think I think it's important. Um, may, maybe not, but but I'll but I'll say it anyway. On the west elevation, um, there's. Our, our guidance to the applicant was was to basically mirror the theme from the west side. And if you take a look on the west side, there's one band of stone that goes right along the edge of the windows. And then there's, uh, thank you. And then there's, you see where, see where that band on the, the left of what we're looking at of stone. Uh, no other side, yeah, right there. Goes along the edge of the window and then to the right, which would be to the south. Um, it's, it's a wider band, correct. Thank you, Emily. And, and so um, that caused a little bit of, of confusion, but, um, but the applicant, based on comments from the hack, um, came back and offered options one and two that would you bring back up for clarity purposes please emily um and and that's the that's that's the driver for for what we're looking at here with the updated let's call them option one a and and two a and uh and the hack is recommending uh one a which we're looking at now uh, and I'm in agreement with that. I am too. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> okay. Okay. So is that did that bring clarity to you, John? 
Yeah, I, I didn't realize that the hack, that the, the second set was, was instigated to, or was a response to the hack comments. Um, I, I guess my comments here would be that I, I find either of these um, acceptable. Um, I'll just make a comment that, that I'm not gonna hold up this application on. But in general, I'm not that comfortable with having applicants kind of give us multiple options and asking us to choose. Um, I think that the, the, the purpose of this board is to approve applications that have been submitted of what people would like to do. And I would like the applicants generally to kind of make that decision of what they prefer and then ask us to approve it. Um, in this case, since this is a response to the hack um, to begin with, I would, uh, I would agree with what I think I heard you guys just say, which is that I would, I would stick with the, the hacks preference here, um, which I believe is the one that's on the screen right now. Okay. Um, so Emily, uh, how I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do for the record, I'm going to do a, uh, a rule uh, vote on that. <laughs> um, and how, how would we, um, how would we identify for the record what we're looking at right now? Um, option one submitted September 23rd. Okay. Okay, so Mr. Riley, if you would make a motion, please. Sure, I'd be happy to make a motion. Um, uh, I, Scott Riley, make a motion for the final plan, re plan review of DP 18-06.3 for the Vermont Hotel Group, LLC, uh, requesting a discretionary permit to revise the building facade, having submitted option 1A, splitting the windows on September 23. Um, the board the board accepts the uh, uh, that option. Great, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second it. David, thank you. Any discussion? No. Okay. Um, yay or nay? Paul? Yay. John Hemelgaard? Yay. Scott Riley? Yay. Dave Turner? Yay. And chair is a yay. Uh, five in favor, not opposed. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. And that option one submitted uh, yesterday, or was it yesterday? Last week. Last week uh, is approved. Okay, with that, uh, the board is going to go into deliberative session. Uh, welcome back to the Town of Wilston Development Review Board. Uh, it is 9-19. Uh, we are out of deliberative session. Uh, is there a motion for DP 20-18? Yes, as authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, David Turner, move the Wilston Development Review Board having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory board, required to comment on the application by the Wilston Development Bylaw, and having, <laughs> and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of September 27, 2022, authorized DP 20-18 to proceed to residential growth management allocation in 2023. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Paul seconds it. Any further comments? No. Okay. Yay or nay? Paul? Yay. Uh, Mr. Hemelgarn is recused. Scott Riley? Yay. Dave Turner? Yay. Uh, Pete Kelly is a yay. Four in favor. Uh, none opposed. One recusal. Motion carries. Is there a motion for DP 10-34.6? Yes, Pete. Uh, <clears throat> as authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, John Hemelgarn, move that the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards required to comment on this application by the Williston Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of September 27th, 2022, accept the findings of fact and conclusions of law for DP 10-34.6 and approve this discretionary permit subject to the conditions of approval above. This approval authorizes the applicant to file final plans, obtain approval of these plans from staff, and then seek an administrative permit for the proposed development, which must proceed in strict conformance with the plans on which this approval is based. 
Thank you, John. Is there a second? I'll second it. Dave Turner seconds. Any further discussion? No. Uh, hearing none, uh, yay or nay? Paul Christensen? Yay. John Hemmelgarn? Yay. Scott Riley? Yay. Dave Turner? Yay. Uh, and I'm a yay, five in favor, not opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, next up is DP 22-06. Is there a motion? Uh, yes, um, as authorized by WD, uh, DB 6.6.3, I select Riley moved that the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff, and the advisory boards required to comment on this application by the Williston Development Bylaw. And having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of August 23rd, 2022, and September 27th, 2022, accept the findings of fact and conclusions of law for DP 22-06 and approve the, uh, this discretionary permit subject to the conditions of the approval above. This approval authorizes the applicant to file final plans obtain approval of these plans from staff and then seek an administrative permit for the per, uh, for the proposed proposed development which must proceed in strict conformance with the plans on which this approval is based uh, there are a couple of uh, changes um, under uh, conclusions of law number six the proposed illumination levels are supported by the site's security needs Number 21, under conditions of approval, uh, the applicant shall provide a temporary easement for a sidewalk along the frontage of Route 2 to benefit Lot 4. And we are adding number 22, uh, all vehicles stored on site shall be available for sale and be fully operable. Thank you, Scott. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, Paul uh, seconds it. Any further discussion? No. Uh, yay or nay? Paul? Yay. John Hemmelgarn? Yay. Scott? Yay. Dave Turner? Yay. Uh, I am a yay. Five in favor, none opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of September 13th, 2022? I move. I move to uh, to approve the minutes of uh, September 13, 2022, as written. Uh, thank you, John. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Scott Riley seconds. Any discussion? <coughs> uh, yay or nay? Paul. Yay. John. Yay. Scott. Yay. Dave. Yay. And chairs are yay. Five in favor. Not opposed. Minutes are approved. Uh, any other business to bring forth for tonight? Uh, just one. Uh, just one thing. Can you give us a quick update on Four Base Code? Sure. Uh, as folks probably have read in the Observer, the Four Base Code has been under discussion at the Select Board for the last couple months. Um, they called for a couple of substantive changes to the draft. Uh, that staff has prepared for them and warned for a public hearing on October 4th. So that's a week from tonight. And they could take action on adoption of the code following that public hearing at the same meeting or at a later date. We don't know for sure, um, but they, they will have both a hearing and a meeting wherein they could consider adoption on uh, October 4th. So we, we may be almost over the goal line with the form based code. But you do have a drop dead date of November 1. Well, as, at the point where we're 150, I want to say 50 days out from the July 5th hearing, okay. uh, the form based code as drafted would no longer be treated as controlling on any developments. Everything would just be handled under the existing bylaw. Under, under what happens today under state law, both sets of rules apply in Taft Corners, which makes it really functionally difficult to approve almost anything big. You can you can do changes of use and you know facade changes and things like that, but um, not no new buildings or sites really, until until we have just one set of zoning rules again uh, covering that area. And I assume the select board understands that. They do. Yeah. Okay. So if not the if not the first meeting or the first this meeting coming up, possibly the one after. Yeah, I I I think the. The hope is that they've adjusted things to their their satisfaction, and that they they would adopt um, 
we've had an awful lot of conversations about building height uh, and setting setting some absolute limits as well as some story and roof pitch limits. And I can quote roof pitches chapter and verse like never before as a result. But um, I think we've gotten to something that um, folks could live with uh, by having an absolute limit as well as the story limit. Thanks. See. Okay. Uh, anything else, Andrew? Welcome. Yep. That was what I was going to say. Well, welcome. welcome to the team. Um, any other? Anything else? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of uh, adjourning, indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, aye. Opposed? Hearing none. We are adjourned. Thank you.